before we talk about China directly, we just want to look at what is some of the trade between Russia and China. And and we'll, we'll go into more detail in it, but we just wanted to look at, on how Chinese-Russian trade has increased and how it's changed. And we talked about it in the beginning uh, of in segment one, looking at you know how we, we uh, just to give you the numbers again, just to make it easier, so you don't have to go back and listen if you're skipping it. If you haven't listened to segment one, dollar receipts accounted for 97 percent of Russia's total exports to China in 2014, but fell to 37 percent as of 3Q 2021. For the for the euro, share rose from one percent to forty eight percent during the same period. So China was essentially relying less on dollars, and Russia was relying less on dollars and more on euro. But now that both of those have been taken away, what can they rely on next? And that's when you start looking at fixed rates and and maybe having some sort of fixed rate shared component in order to manage that. So even all of these pieces, so the trade between Russia and China has doubled in the last five years, but a lot of that is on the energy front. So it's important because we're going to show how important the U.S. and U.S. allies are to China, and it's exponentially bigger than how how important Russia is on a, on a dollar basis. But on the type of product, China can't exist or exist in the same way without Russian energy. And that's, I think, some of the, the, the pivots where, yes, they, they've increased in trade, they'll continue to increase in trade, and it still, it still is dwarfed by the amount of trade the U.S. does with China. But without Russia, there, there is no engine to the, to the Chinese economy. There is no power to it. And that becomes as, as the overarching piece that we have to look at between the two. So what, what is happening right now? A uh, rapidly spreading outbreak of, uh, of cases in China. Uh, Omicron comes to hit home. Uh, as, as those that, that live through Omicron, I'm sure you're aware that if you looked at somebody with it, you got it. Um, and, and again, it, was just, it, it ripped through. Uh, we, we, we sh- we'll see how much this impacts things, but they are going into different lockdowns. So when you look at where things are and, and the outbreaks that are coming through, there was a bit of a hope that the PBOC was going to do more. And, and I, we've been talking about how the PBOC is kind of hamstrung on what they can do because all they've been doing is easing and they're not getting the same reaction that they were hoping for. So when you look at, you know, they, they injected cash, they put liquidity in, but the PBOC kept interest rates uh, on, on MLF funds unchanged at 2.8, uh, 2.85%. So if Beijing wants lending rates for households and companies to fall, the MLF rate has to drop first. That's because the benchmark loan prime rate is anchored to it. But so they they want consumers to spend, but they're concerned of of them spending on leverage. And and, and that's there's still this big issue and concern on how they're spending. Where are they spending? What money are they utilizing to spend, which is very different when you look at some of these different, uh, the, the different pieces. It wasn't unreasonable to expect it, but again, we've been talking about it. Uh, the, the stock market has dropped uh, sharply th- throughout the week with the Shanghai Composite Index falling almost 5% on Tuesday alone. We know that is reversed, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But the supply chain pressure from the cases, as well as the uncertainty with Russia's invasion, it, it becomes with, well, what happens next? And that's why COVID happening now, especially in some of these very large exporting regions, becomes a much bigger issue. And then it should be, uh, so, so why, no, why didn't they cut? So it's, uh, it could be because economic data published this week was so far better, or they're waiting for the Fed to uh, increase rates. Uh, so again, there's a lot of things going far, but we're not sure. We, we just don't think the Fed, uh, we don't think the PBOC is going to be as aggressive as people hope. And that's where I, I think some of that, that is going to have to pivot and people are going to have to kind of reshape what their expectations are for Chinese growth. So then when we look at trade and, and China in general, uh, exports beat expectations. They came in at 16.3% uh, versus uh, 14%, but imports missed. And remember, imports speak on two things, local demand and what future exports will look like. And that's why we continue to have this concern on where things are, are heading out, how things are going to get priced, and really where are we going to see some of these different shakeouts. 
So then you look at in uh, in Shanghai mortgages uh, mortgages and consumer loans were down 10.4 percent year on year in January, even as real estate prices in the city continue to rise. As a result, uh, Shanghai banks will loosen loan restrictions to credit to gain to grow again. So they're trying to also adjust kind of where, you know, exports are going to slow. So you need to do something. You need to kind of spark that somewhere else. So banks have ditched tightening measures introduced mid-2021. So banks have adjusted it. So does the PBOC have to do as much as they need to if the banks are doing it for them? And that's where you kind of have this this balancing act that PBOC is trying to do because they don't want to do too much. Because they, they're still trying to pull pull down debt. They're still trying to get leverage under control. So they don't want to do both. They're, and that's why I think you're getting more of that settling, especially with where trade was and some of the concerns that there's going to be as we continue through what is going to be a, a fairly broad slowing situation. Now, when you look at how the markets reacted, Lou sought to reassure investors with several promises, support all companies wanting to get listed overseas, formulate a detailed plan with U.S. regulators to resolve issues around U.S. audit requirements for U.S. listed Chinese firms, implement standardized transfer, uh, transparent and predictable regulations for platform companies, complete the, re, uh, the rectification or crackdown of major internet platform companies post haste. So that was enough to really get people excited. And But at the same time, the, my, my old boss used to say the, uh, the term too much too fast. And when you have too much too fast, you're going to get this this massive bounce. And I think that's exactly what happened here. You know, you, you had these big moves down in China, and now you're getting kind of that snapback. So I think there's going to be things going forward of, you know, the FSDC is doing what it can to stop the bleeding, but there are still plenty of downside risk to Chinese stocks. Two reasons to, uh, you know, so possible secondary sanctions on China for its alleged support of Russia's invasion. The U.S. has now said that they uh, are going to send drones to uh, Ukraine and they will be armed. You know, does China say, look, you know, you, you shouldn't do that. And they start to go back and forth. I, you know, there's there was a, a very tense meeting in uh, in in Europe between China and the U.S. over Ukraine and uh, and, Ru- and Russia and what the different parties are going to play in that. And then the worsening domestic COVID outbreak and how bad it gets. So the FSDC can put co- uh, coherent policies for internet companies in place that could do a lot to clarify the outlook for Chinese tech stocks. But there's still those on- ongoing issues with uh, with the um, the property side, investment side, and then obviously on the export front. So now when we look at some of the data that's come out, uh, PPI came in higher than ex- uh, expected. It was expected at 8.6%, came in at 8.8%. But CPI came in, uh, was expected at 0.9, came at 0.9. Remember, the government is trying to, to insulate. So even though gate prices continue to go up, you know, producer prices continue to go up, they're trying to keep that from hitting the consumer. And that's, I think, some of the bigger issues that we're seeing. And at what point, based on all of the money the government is spending, do they have to yield and let those prices go back up? So now when we look at uh, new, uh, new yuan loans, it missed estimates. It was expected at $1.45 uh, trillion, came in at $1.23 trillion. Aggregate financing was expected at two point two, dollars came in at one, uh, uh, $11.9 uh, yeah, I'm sorry, one, 1.19. A money supply uh, sli- shrunk on the M2 side, the M0, M1 slightly bigger. So again, you're starting to see some of these shifts. So you're not seeing this growth and you, and that's why you then you look at um at uh, medium term lending the expectation expectation was for 2.75 came in at 2.85 they were expecting that small cut so yeah uh, so far foreign direct investment uh, came in strong came in at 37.9% industrial production came in at 7.5% much better than expectations fixed asset 12.2% uh, almost double uh, uh, more than double expectations retail sales Double expectations at 6.7%. Again, all of that is a net positive. Jobless rate, slightly higher than expected. Property investment was expected at negative 7, came in at 3.7. So when you start looking at the first blush, it's pretty good. And and you have to respect the fact that it, it came out to a strong start. But what did you have? You had the Olympics. You had Lunar New Year. You had a lot of things happening that created some of this, you know, this driving force. 
So when you look at these different pieces, you know, it is, it's always difficult to uh, un- unpick the impact of Chinese New Year on economic trends in the first two months of the year. The full Q1 numbers should give a better read on kind of the trend. January, February is strong. Where's March? How is March setting up and and how are we getting those impacts? And I think that's going to be kind of the bigger way because all of this is also backwards looking. This is all February. Most of the country is going into extended lockdowns. How much is that going to impact retail sales activity, which again is going to uh, kind of reverse that? Or as people saw some of these issues rising, they started to kind of preemptively get involved to make sure things were okay. Because again, a lot has changed since February. Uh, you know, you have uh, you have the uh, COVID war in Ukraine has sent global commodity prices sky high and has raised the risk of Chinese companies getting caught up in secondary sanctions. And then it is hard to see the strong numbers for the start of 2022 to be sustained. To what extent was China's ambitious 5.5% GDP growth target for this year set off these strong numbers rather than more recent developments? And then policymakers may need to adjust to a new normal. You know, then you look at Chinese new home prices coming down month over month. You're not seeing again that that. Re- and remember, th- this home prices and real estate is a huge part of a, essentially growth and and consumer value, which is going to become another pressure point. So then when you look at service PMI, uh, survey was for fifty point uh, for Caxton. Survey was fifty point seven, came in at fifty point two. Market Hong Kong PMI came in at 42.9. So 42.9. So Hong Kong is, has had a COVID issue already, and you're seeing what those some of those impacts are. Now, when you look at February for Chinese services and Chinese activity, it was already kind of bumping along the bottom. So now mix in a lockdown and some of these different routes you're going to most likely have an even bigger impact versus where things currently sit, which is why, again, we remain concerned on what the underlying growth is going to be. But March is going to be kind of the tell-all. And, and I think that's going to be the important one to, to, to see. What does March show? Are, was this kind of a one-off uh, in terms of January, February? Or is it continuing and pushing further into the rest of the, uh, the quarter? Local government faces a rising interest payment burden, and that's something that we've been talking about. The When you look at the special purpose bonds, that's the one. The SPBs are the ones that con- that were continue to grow. And when you look at what 2022 holds, they're going to get bigger. So you not only have to roll your debt from 2021 and, be, and before, you're going to have to layer on more debt, which is going to put in more pressure, more problems. Total loans to the property sector continue to fall. Total land and property development loans also fell. All of those things, again, when you look at growth in loans, that is a big piece of how the local areas, the local governments get get financing, get money. So without that, you're going to see that additional pressure, which is why how much longer can the governments uh, afford to protect their their people, can try to uh, you know buffer the impacts, if you will, of these different pricing, uh, uh, the uh, inflation and these different pricing regimes. This is just looking at uh, direct investment. You know, obviously much higher. Things uh, were were much better, but how much of that is going to continue? given where things are and some of the pressure points that we continue to see. Then you have Chinese public spending will recover in 2022. But if they increase spending, they've they've been increasing spending the whole time. So where have they cut with what money, with what borrowing? And this is where it's going to get difficult to see where are they going to be able to source the the additional funds to continue to not only protect the uh, the uh, consumers trying to drive up spending, trying to drive up that growth while you continue to see those underlying pressure points. So then when you look at China and, and Russia and the US, so Russian oil exports are obviously gone up 30, uh, 33% is, is China's share of Russian oil exports. Russia's share of China oil imports, you know, 15% likely going higher. But Russia is trivial is trivial to um, a trivial market for China. But I'm I'm going to change that word because I don't think trivial is the right term. Because when you look at where things are, they China needs Russia. It's energy. It, they need the energy to keep everything, the manufacturing going, the prices moving. 
But when you look at the exports by destination, the US and the EU are massive in comparison. So if you look at GDP growth, they need Russia to keep the the engine running of the economy, but they need to sell the product to someone. And that's where this comes in and why it becomes so important to see how they manage this and why China has to walk the line of how much risk are they willing to take with who, where, like, so all of these important pieces become a huge problem as you look at what is coming down the road. Then you look at Thailand, the uh, Thailand CPI uh, was survey was for 4.1, came in at 5.3, consumer confidence is dropping. All of these pieces, just as we keep talking about, are, are pointing to more and more problems when you look at emerging market health, how much demand are we going to see as they come under renewed pressure? Now, South Korea export prices uh, index month over month came in at 2.1%. Uh, year over year came in at 20.3%. All of these pieces, uh, we're just showing this because this is all Feb. So you get an idea of how much uh, more aggressive it's going to be as you look into March, especially as sanctions continue to bite and South Korea limits the amount that they're sending or exporting into Russia. And it's going to, making it difficult for Russia to sell, counter sanctions from Russia towards South Korea. All of these pieces are going to increase underlying prices at South Korea, which they export to us. So then again, increasing prices for the U.S. Core CPI was expected at 3%, came in at 3.2. You know, just, and this is after the South Korean Central Bank has raised rates already, which just shows you rates are going one direction. They're going to continue to go up and continue to, to push that higher. South Korea bank lending to households year over year uh, coming in at 5.7%. Again, more pressure in terms of where the, that resides. Japan, household spending spiked in Jan, will likely uh, normalize a bit in February and come under more pressure in March. Uh, exports missed expectations where they were hoping for 20.6, came in at 19.1, but imports were much better. So we should see some of that recover. Industrial production dipped uh, with capacity utilization as well. That should start to, that reverses in Feb, but then it comes under more pressure as we come into March. Consumer confidence was expected at 35, came in at 35.3, so slightly better than expected. But again, this is March. We're in, uh, this is February. We're in March. And things have, uh, have shifted pretty aggressively when you take a look at the world. Now, Japan PPI expected at 8.6%, came at 9.3%. And then Japan uh, consumer price expectations, percentage of consumer expecting inflation of 2% or more is at 75.4%. And that was February. So just think about where this is going to go going forward. So India uh, PMI composite came in at 53.5, uh, services 51.8 industrial production right in line. Wholesale prices were expected at 12.1%, came in at 13.1%. Exports came in at 25.1%. Imports came in much better at 36.1%. So imports were better, again, leading to a bit, uh, you know more support on the export front, but CPI was expected at 6%, came in at 607 Wholesale prices are going back up. India is, again, they're trying to manage their inflationary pressures, but we expect this to continue to go up. And remember, 6% is the ceiling, and they're, this is the second month that they're above the ceiling, and we do expect that to continue to spiral as we go into March. India wholesale prices are still remaining at near all-time highs as CPI year-over-year year continues to be sticky and elevated. India mon- monthly rural, rural output tracker uh, came in uh, slightly up, but the output growth is coming in negative, which is when you start looking forward, we expect this to roll and be a pressure point as we go into next month. And then the GDP tracker, uh, when you look at the index, uh, when you look at the growth profile, things continue to kind of roll over a bit, especially as we have more pressure on the inflation front and the global market continues to slow due to what is happening in uh, you know just the different global events. Uh, between China, obviously Russia, Ukraine, all the fun stuff. So that's what we have for you today. If you have any questions, you can find us in the comments section or on Twitter. You know, hopefully this was helpful. If you have any feedback and want us to address anything specific, you know, feel free to reach out and uh, and let us know. Thanks again for watching. I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Primer Vision Network.